Hi Zwifters, I'm Simon Schofield and this is the Zwiftcast. I decided to start the Zwiftcast so that if you want you can get your Zwifty news, discussions and debates in audio form. Perfect for listening to whilst on the train app. So, who am I? Well, I spent much of my career in television production, and now I'm a freelance cycling journalist. But perhaps more importantly, I've been an enthusiastic indoor rider in winter for years. I spend a lot of time riding outdoors in summer, and like lots of you, I think what Zwift is doing is incredibly exciting for the colder, darker months. I'm a novice podcaster, but I'd love to hear what you'd love to hear in upcoming episodes. You can find me at Zwiftcast.com or on the Facebook groups and you can leave me voicemails on Skype at simon.scofield63. So, let's get on with episode one of the Zwiftcast. We've got a bit of Zwift-related news in a few moments, but here's what else is coming up. The man behind the Zwift workout mode test, coach John Sharples, talks us through how to get through an FTP test. It is the most amount of power that you can sustain. So sustain is the key word for 20 minutes. And speaking of power, what is Zwift Chief Exec Eric Min's FTP? I have I have nothing to hide. I did my my FTP test. I think I scored 274. I weigh 70 kilograms, so that puts me at 3.9 watts per kilogram. Much, much more from Eric later in the Zwift cast. I'm also talking to respected Zwifter Mick Neal about what we'd both like to see happen on the island and in Richmond. And we've got some tips and advice if you're racing or you'd like to get yourself on the start line for the first time. Let's catch up with a bit of news. Zwift has just announced they'll be sponsoring a women's pro team in the shape of the Canyon Shram racing setup. We can expect to see team members in the game and they'll join the growing numbers of pro riders spotted Zwifting. Zwift are also forming a relationship with the MTN Quebec team and the sponsorship of the Canyon Shram racing team looks like a move to attract more female riders to Zwift. Eric Min has plenty to say about this issue later in the Zwiftcast. We'll also have an interview with Cassie Baldy, who started ladies-only events with the aim of increasing female participation. Now, the Facebook groups have been alive with news and opinion, as ever, and the Zwiftcast will be regularly summarising some of the hotter topics for those who find the social media activity hard to keep up with. This episode, Shane Miller joins me for a catch-up. Hi Shane, uh, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your uh, cycling history? G'day Simon, thanks for having me on. Uh, at the competitive side, I'm really focused on time trials quite a lot, um, a lot of racing. Um, I took it up a bit too late, so I've sort of gone to the Masters racing scene and done pretty well through um, throughout my progression there. And uh, along the way, always using indoor trainers. Specific training outside of the road environment where there's cars, interruptions and weather and things like that. So I've used indoor training for many, many years. um, And I've used all different solutions, um, static videos to YouTube playlists to you name it, absolutely anything. Um, And then along came the kicker. Um, which sort of combined my love of technology and cycling. Um, And then along came Zwift about six months ago, actually. It came out for the Mac. And, uh, yeah, the rest is online, I guess, in history. (laughs) Is it big in Australia, Zwift? I mean, we tend to think in the Northern Hemisphere that your weather's fantastic all the time, so why would you ride indoors? Strangely enough, indoor cycling is actually very big in Australia. Um, We ride a lot outdoors, absolutely, but I think everyone who's really... <clears throat> serious about their sport will go indoors they'll do the 30 minute session indoors because even if we live even if you've got a nice stretch of road or the, the sun's out if you've only got 30 minutes it takes two minutes to put your shoes on and go indoors you don't have to worry about kitting up and getting your helmet on all these other things that come into play so it's actually disproportionately popular 
Interesting. With the amount of cyclists we have, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Shane, you're a respected voice in the uh, in the Zwift community, so I thought I'd rope you in for a feature that really just looks at what's being talked about, uh, mainly on the Facebook groups over the past couple of weeks, and kind of get your take on some of the big subjects. So let's start with uh, something that came up that caught my interest, which was a bit of a debate, um, and it was what we were just talking about, um, whether miles indoors are real miles in training terms. Some people, the kind of hardened clubman fraternity, tend to dismiss the value of indoor training. What, what's your take on that? The old school will say no. Um, for me, I say absolutely. I, I say one for one. They're, they're equal. Some more... Uh, I guess you can go down the path of there's no coasting indoors, but these days with Swift and a smart trainer, there is a little bit. There's nothing like putting it in the 5311 down the Watopia Hill and you don't really have to pedal a lot. Um, I'd say they're one for one. And given the the, uh, the technology behind Swift, I've actually taken, and don't tell anybody this, but I've, I've taken Swift outdoors. I've put a laptop in the backpack and I went for a ride, real world, under same conditions, um, you know, not a lot of wind, few little rolling hills for 30 kilometres. The only difference was 100 metres between the two compared. Oh, um, so it was taking the, the power from my cranks and the distance I rode. So that little experiment I did over in Perth, I, I, they're one for one for me, absolutely. Yeah, I think most people who are serious about training have always seen the value of indoor training. Mm-hmm. It can be very focused. And the thing with Zwift is, uh, you know, um, and I'm not sure whether this is a benefit, but actually it's really difficult to go for an easy ride on Zwift. If you've got an ounce of competitiveness uh, within you, it's very hard not to get drawn into little battles. And that, that leads me on to my next one, which is, can you use Zwift too much? Is it kind of possible to overtrain on Zwift? Once you've got a carrot dangling in front of you, like that green jersey or the KOM jersey or the full lap jersey, you'll go really, really hard. It'll add that incentive to go super hard. As for can you overtrain, depending if you're doing long, long Ks indoors, very static, um, you can get a little bit sort of locked into the position and you'll get very tired very quickly. Um so I think it's possible, but as for the short one-hour sessions a day, you'll, you'll struggle, you'll, you'll um, overreach, but if you recover well, um, you'll be able to do that day in, day out. So one thing you just have to watch for is, you know, you're pushing yourself too hard too many days in a row. There's always got to be a rest day thrown in there. Yeah, I think that's the key, really. I mean, I've raced uh, on Zwift over winter more mm-hmm. than I ever would have done before which was you know like hardly at all because there's very little scope for racing in the northern hemisphere winter is, mm-hmm. it, is it healthy do you think to carry on racing all year round which is something that Zwift encourages for me I'm evergreen I will race all year round um, with a week off here and there but you just have to be careful not not too much all the time um, you cannot be on top of your game 365 days a year not at all um and you've got to enjoy it as well. So there's got to be days where you turn off a little bit and uh, smell the roses or um, yeah, look for the squirrels, I guess, on Zwift. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Mm-hmm. We are seeing, and I've experienced this personally, personally a, a couple more glitches than we're used to seeing. Do you think the guys are handling the big increase in capacity technically to a satisfactory standard are, are we seeing too many glitches and again this has come up in the in the groups that people are reporting uh, kind mm-hmm. of frustrating occurrences are you seeing much of that i don't quite know what's going on in the back end but me from a technical perspective when that happens you look at the logs look at the capacity look at where the um issues actually lie and then just crank up the capacity so i going from i think today i, I use the app quite a lot look I'll, I'll be honest i'm addicted to loading the app and giving everyone a thumbs up and i saw there was about 300 to 400 people on today for on a day-to-day basis to have nearly three to four hundred people on and it not being too bad i think they're doing a pretty good job but they just have to be sure that it's on 24 7 people get so um i mean endurance cyclists are very passionate very very passionate people (laughs) so if they can't log in and do their zwift session oh you'll you'll hear about it yeah Um, i think if you're set up to train and you you know you've, you've got your shoes on and you're ready for a hard hour and some kind of technical hassle gets in the way, it, your reaction tends to be a bit sort of disproportionate. 
For sure. We're also seeing that with the updates as well. Now, again, from a technical side, we can all understand the, the updates and pushing updates, but if you've got a small bandwidth connection or somebody else is using a connection, you have to wait 15 minutes before you start pedaling. That can be a bit frustrating. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to see in the future what they do. Yeah. I guess with something like Zwift, which is very innovative, you've got to expect uh, some growing pains and some minor teething troubles and and perhaps uh, perhaps people on the group ought to be a little more understanding maybe no one's had a thousand cyclists on on a cycling server before because there hasn't been one of these mm. um, so they're actually breaking new ground which I, I give them a lot of um, a lot of slack for without a doubt because uh, yeah it's 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 very unique um, yeah. they're pioneers absolutely Anything that's caught your eye on the uh, on the groups uh, over the past couple of weeks? One of the latest ones was the drafting effect. Now, um, I was on online the other day with uh, on the Ted King ride, and uh, it was just a, a casual ride. It wasn't a race, um, and you know, off we go riding along with Ted King. Anyway, Ted King gets dropped, and he's trying to ride back on, but the front group keep pulling away, pulling away, and we're only doing two point five three watts per kilo. Um, which is a solid pace, a good tempo pace, but uh, you know, anybody can sort of pull that back. It seems to be the, the physics model is um, a little bit generous for the bunches at the moment, um, and they're still playing with that on Zwift. Um, there's been a few changes made lately, which uh, have caused even more problems. So what they're trying to do is model the outside world. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still a game, and if you know how that actually works, um, you can play the game, and I think the rule at the moment is never ever get dropped from the front group. Never, <laughs> it's never so hard to get the that draft. One. Never <laughs> ever it. lose the draft, otherwise uh, <laughs> you're dead. As uh, so as, I- it, as even Ted King found out. Shane, it's been fantastic chatting to you. I hope we can make this a regular feature. It's great to hear from uh, from Zwift Australia. Thanks very much indeed for your time, and uh, thanks very much for your contribution to the Zwiftcast. No worries, Simon. I look forward to the uh, future editions. There's a lot to talk about. We've got six months of of, uh, discussions to catch up on and uh, I'm sure we'll have many many months of discussions in the future about where it's going and uh, yeah where it's headed I had a long chat with Eric Min, the chief exec and co-founder of Zwift, and I think one of the advantages of a podcast like this is you don't need to condense these types of longer conversations into short sound bites. But I covered a whole lot of ground with Eric, so I am going to break it up and scatter it through this first episode of the Zwiftcast. Here's the first part. Just who is Eric Min? Eric, we know you raced a bit as a junior, but I'm sure people are really interested in knowing a bit more about you. Tell us a bit about yourself, both as a cyclist and a person. Um, I've been, a, I guess, a long-time cycling enthusiast uh, since, I was, since I was probably 13 years old. Uh, picked up cycling through a friend uh, and, and quickly joined a, a local club in New York where, where I grew up. And uh, during, I guess it was about three or four years of, of racing as a junior, I got to a, you know, like a ne- competitive on a, on a national level. I took cycling pretty seriously. Um, and uh, it, was only, it was only until I realized that I didn't have the kind of talent that some of the riders around me had, I decided that uh, um, I probably should focus on a career. <laughs> So I, I started a career in um, in banking and and technology. My partner and I built a, a trading platform, trading system for the financial and commodities markets. We actually sponsored a, a U25 team, which then grew to become uh, part of the Garmin development team. Out of our program, which lasted five years, we graduated seven professionals, um, and two of them are active world tour riders. It allowed me to stay connected with the sport that I, I've loved for, for so many years. What I can see there is is the threads that have, have been pulled together to create Zwift. You've clearly got some uh, IT experience, you've got a passion for cycling. Was Zwift always part of the plan? I exited my last venture last, uh, it was last March. 
So I've been looking for for months about okay, what am I going to do next? And the last place I looked at was was the cycling space. Although my my partner, who is not a cyclist, uh, egged me on to look at cycling because I you know I, I had so much vested interest in, in in that industry and and the sport. In the absence of any better idea, I thought okay, let me take another crack at at cycling. At the same time, I you know I've been living in London and struggling to to ride outside, so I I've been confined to my um, you know my my man cave for for a few years now, and I've consumed all the different products that are out there, and none of them were satisfactory. So I thought, wow, what if we could make indoor cycling fun? Things like social social networks, or you know the gaming technology, or the fact that you can. You can be in a virtual space with others, or you're having a platform where you could be in a space with thousands of people, not just you know ten or or twenty people. So we spent two years, Scott Barger and I spent two months, sorry, traveling to to Europe and North America to you know find out if this might uh, be of interest to partners to be part of this project, and it was uh, it was interesting. We got some great feedback. That so was enough for us to to seed the business and. And, and take it from there. So that was actually, I mean, we pulled the team together April of last year. So we've, it's, it's only been about a year and a half. And more from Eric later. Francis Coppix, Casey Shum, this is a strong, strong group of riders today. A lot of the big hitters have shown up for today's uh, ZTR early boards or UK, UK Europe race. And uh, this is uh, this is quite uh, quite a group of riders, actually. That was the fantastic Nathan Guerra with some of his inspired race commentary, which he streams live on Twitch during Zwift races. If you want to find out more, head for twitch.tv slash Nathan Guerra. And Guerra is G-U-E-R-R-A. We'll get Nathan on to the next episode of the Zwiftcast. But in the meantime, let's take a look at the racing scene on Zwift. And this interview with James Gill has lots of tips for those who've not yet entered a race. Welcome to the Zwiftcast to James Gill, who will be a very familiar name to anybody who races on Zwift, as he's one of the primary UK organisers of uh, Tuesday and Thursday races, as well as some on Friday. Um, James, um, we estimate, or of Zwift estimate, that only around 10% of the user base race. What can we say to the other 90% to encourage them into the racing fold? You're going to get better if you have someone to push off against. Even just good-natured competition, you kind of push that little bit harder, and that actually makes it fun. It's what this is all about. But some people find competition intimidating. Should they be intimidated by the competition on Zwift? We recently ran the Fox and Hound race. The Foxes were trying to stay ahead of the Hounds. They set off five minutes before, and the Hounds had to chase them down. The Foxes that crossed the line first, they did brilliantly. I mean, they slogged their guts out. But every single fox, it didn't matter if they're a court or not, still had fun going around because you've got that competitive aspect. Rather than just, I'm going for a loop round, I'm going to see how far I can get. Can I do something against this group of you know, people who are chasing me down? I think one of the things that's attractive about racing on Zwift is it's not just one race. There's, there are different categories. Talk us through how that works. Well, we've got the categories um, based upon what people think that they're putting out in terms of their wattages, um, and that's how much power a rider is able to produce. And that's given us four categories that Christian Weidman's sort of brought over from real world racing. If I set myself up as a, as a B rider, I'm probably not going to be able to keep up with the pack the whole way around, and actually it gets a little bit demoralising. If I put myself in as a C category rider, then I'm going to be able to keep up with people at a similar level because I've, we've got an idea as to what wattage we're expecting someone like that to put out. Using the categories can actually help you have an enjoyable race ride without feeling that you're completely against people who are far beyond your leg capabilities. You, you'll toggle between B and C. In Zwift etiquette terms, is that 
is is that perfectly acceptable? Absolutely, because it's about getting out there. Any time that time on Zwift, any time that's on the bike, is actually a win. Um, one of the things we, we talk about sometimes at work, because I'm a medic, is your couch is trying to kill you. You know, get out of your chair, do something. You, you're still competing. You're still winning compared to someone that hasn't. What are the most common mistakes that you see first-time racers make and how should they avoid them? I think the, the, the biggest thing is setting your sights too high, thinking that I'm going to compete with some, some of the big names like Frank Garcia and um, Casey Shum. Um, so you've got an idea that you think that you're going to be able to hold out over 300 watts for over an hour. Definitely, first crack, go for it. But... It gets really hard work if you're chasing them, you burn a match, you're pushing all the while, whereas they've not actually dropped the hammer yet. When they decide to leave you, you end up left on your own and you end up basically doing a 45-minute, half-an-hour TT on your own, which is quite uncomfortable because you've not got the other riders to push off and bounce off. You don't get the draft effect. And it's possible that that's the sort of thing could stop you coming back next time. I think it's always better to push go down a category what you think you might be you can race with someone who's higher if you're keeping up with them but you're not setting your sight at an almost an unreal or an untested um challenge i i think that's very sensible advice and that that's tactical advice about about riding a race but i think some people uh, don't really have a clue kind of where to start where should i go what should i do just talk us through the five minutes before the race starts for a first timer what should they be doing so i'll normally log in 20 minutes before a race to start making sure that my kit's set up and start you know welcoming other riders as they pop in as we move to the last 10 minutes of the race i'm starting to send out um global communication saying uh, to everyone on the island saying the ZTREB's about to start in 10 minutes you know come along to the start line explaining how many laps we'll be doing if it's three four five laps saying explaining where the neutral sections are going to be so we have a nice steady warm-up to make sure everyone's kit's working um and that they've, they've, everyone's managed to get in the ride at the same time that lets everybody catch up and then explaining where the the, the go point will be where the hammer really drops and everybody shoots off if you see any of those things and think i'd like to come along simply turn up on the start line with everyone else. We shout what the start time's going to be. As long as you stay behind the race leader in the neutral, who's normally identified in his name, that's all you need for the start. If you find that you've, you know, you've pushed too hard over one lap and want to drop out, that's great. You've started off with the race. Come back next week. They run every week. Try to get a little bit further. Yep, <clears throat> all good stuff. James, do you think racing on Zwift is going to continue to grow? I'm sure it will do. And the, the number of things that could come out of Zwift racing moving forwards is absolutely colossal. I mean, the, the Zwift guys, they have more ideas. The actual teams that have built Zwift have more ideas than they have hours in the day at the moment. I guarantee that racing will become a big thing in Zwift in both in the, the unofficial capacity that it is at the minute and in an official capacity when the race module actually gets launched hopefully later on in the year, start of 2016. James, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you for talking to the listeners of the Swiftcast. Thank you for organising all the races that you do. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the start line. Not at all. And in terms of that, I'd like to thank everyone that turns up. At the end of the day, a race is just simply a Facebook um, event and someone shouting go. The races don't work if the riders don't come. And thanks to everybody who turns up for them. They're the ones that make it entertaining and fun. As James was saying there, the racing is dependent on its participants, and very few of those are female. It's something that Zwift is well aware of and is working to change. Here's the head honcho Eric Min on female participation on the platform. In terms of percentages, I would say that uh, 92% are men, 8% are, are women. And we'd like to see that percentage of women grow. Um, and if you speak to the industry, over the next five years, they all believe that half the buyers will, will be women. So there's a big push within the industry to, to create product lines that are catering to, to ladies. And so I, I think 
I think I like to think that we can help, you know, um, um, support that that growth. Um, it's an it's an easy place to get started um, where you can build fitness. And there's a lot of things you can learn on with things like like uh, etiquette. Right. I mean, w- there's no handbook about you know, how do you behave in a in a group ride or uh, <laughs> uh and I think a lot of those things uh, um, apply even on Zwift. And there's so fitness and how to behave in, in a social um, group rides can be learned on, on, on the platform. And one Zwifter who's taking a lead in this area is Cassie Baldy. So hello and welcome to the Zwiftcast to Cassie Baldy, who's recently started a ladies only group on Facebook with the aim of encouraging more uh, women to cycle on Zwift. But first of all, Cassie, just tell us a little bit about yourself and in particular your cycling history and how you came across Zwift. I, um, I'm 27 and I am a very keen cyclist. Started off indoor cycling, so um, spinning. Um, my husband then encouraged me to try out cycling outside. He got me my first um, road bike, um, and then he said, oh, well, you're going to come out to the Alps. I've only been cycling for about a month or so. So he said, I'll oh, come out to the Alps and try out some riding. Um, really enjoyed it. First descent, I come off my bike. Oh, no. <laughs> but I got back on. I, that was all, all good. And then he said, right, get, get you um, get you going doing a sportif out in France. And we did the sportif and I come dead last. <laughs> out of the wind dead last it was my first one i'd never done anything like this before and then from there six years later after that i'm still cycling i'm still enjoying it i've got stronger from um building and proper training and this year i managed to come first in my age group and first overall in a sportif over there which i'm really happy with oh congratulations that's a fantastic journey from dead last to first um tell me why you started the ladies only facebook group for me i can see why women would get discouraged because men are fast men are strong and men have got i mean you know i'm probably you know am strong but i i still come last in some of the races so if I'm discouraged, then I'm sure there's other women out there that are going to be discouraged. And I thought, well, if we gather a community together of women, then we can encourage each other to take part in these races and these even group rides. And then, then we can sort of get the process rolling of getting more women out there. Good idea. And what reaction did you get on, on announcement? I know there was a little bit of opposition, but let's concentrate on the positive. How many... Uh, how many women responded and what kind of response did you get? Um, I got over, well over 100 women responding to my request of starting a group and they've joined. So I have over 100 women now on the Facebook group. And what kind of things were they saying to you? They felt like they wasn't fast enough. Um, They felt like it was quite a male-dominated thing. And they just wanted to feel like they were in a community and feel welcome. Um, and they, they said to me, once I set it up, I got lots of sort of um, messages saying, thank you for this. I feel like I'm integrated. I can talk openly um, with other women. And it's not just about women's stuff. It's just generally feeling that they are accepted in the community rather than feeling like there's, there's all these people, even, even if other men, just like bombarding with all these posts about this and this and this. Well, we just want to post about our achievements and maybe we just want to be felt like we are doing the right thing and a bit more training advice specific to women because we are different. I mean, there's never going to be a group race in the pro peloton with women and men together. We are different. We're not the same. We are, we are slower. We're not going to be Tour de France. I mean, women are too, seem to be too scared to put forward their thoughts because always they get the men sort of say this, this and this and this. Do you think that this could be a springboard for trying to increase the numbers of women in total on Zwift? Because 8% is a surprisingly low figure. Yes, yeah. I mean, I'm getting women who are not even on Zwift into my group now um, to encourage them to go and do training indoors. Now, especially the season is changing. Even if it's 50 women and they're on Zwift, and then they tell their friends. 
because it's going to be more of a social experience for women than it is going to be for men I think I think they want to be felt like they're wanted in the community rather than men where they just go for it and drive so knowing other women are involved in it then it encourages the ones that are not involved to give it a go well I think the vast majority of the Zwift community would applaud you for what you're doing and and support you in your efforts. So congratulations, the best of luck with it, and thanks very much for talking to the Zwiftcast. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me on there. Coming up, a really useful suite of advice from coach John Sharples on how to prepare for and complete an FTP test. And we've got an interview with long-standing Zwifter Christian Wiedemann. But now for a bit of fun. I got together with Mick Neal, a guy who's been on Zwift since the very beginning, for a bit of a moan. We wanted to vent a little about stuff we'd really like to see on Zwift that's not on Zwift yet. So welcome to the Zwiftcast to Mick Neal, who is based in the Chicago area. And I thought it might be fun and possibly interesting to talk to him about how Zwift has developed and how it may develop in the future. Um, But first of all, Mick, welcome. And um, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you use Zwift and how you cycle in real life. Let's see. Best place to start. Well, Chicago winters can be pretty brutal. So most people hole up in their basements here. Also, when Zwift came on the scene, I jumped on it and um, seems to be the solution to all my problems. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the one thing I'd like to see fixed, though, is the, the few little bugs that have hung on from, you know, update after update after update. It's it's just, it's not a major thing. It's just niggling. And I think most people have adapted to uh, just seeing them there and letting them go. But you get the newbies coming on and, and you get a lot of, uh, I guess you could call it whinging about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a few pet whinges as well. So why don't we have a little bit of a whinge fest and uh, and go through some of the, um, so the niggles and bugs that annoy us and perhaps speculate about, about why they're not fixed. What's your least favorite niggle? Oh, changing the name in the game. So once you're in game and you, let's say you're running late to join a group ride and you need to get put that suffix on your name yeah so many people complaining i can't make a change it does show up for everybody else but you know unless you see it you don't know if it actually took so that's that's a an easy one there i think okay well my next one uh is uh, is based around the uh, workup mode which has been a a successful launch i think and a, a very welcome addition to uh, to the options on Swift and, and lots of people are using it but I wish that they would um, uh, have a power smoothing option a three second power smoothing option yes that's been uh, I've, I've heard about that from day one I mean anybody that rides with power knows you need that three at least three seconds smoothing and it would make quite a difference Mm. And we see lots of questions from new starters saying my power's leaping around all over the place. Uh, so I get, and I, th- I think that would be a, a really welcome fix. Yeah. Now, I don't notice it as much on a kicker. Um, I actually have a um, tax Bushido that I'm setting up for somebody. So I was testing it and that jumped around a little bit, but compared to the... Uh, the kicker was actually very smooth compared to that. So I don't know if it's, it's probably a trainer specific issue. It would actually help a lot in group rides too, because when you're trying to stay in the draft, um, that does make a big difference. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, okay, well, in this niggle contest, uh, next round to you. Uh, weight rounding bug. Um, people who use uh, kilograms may not see it, but in, if you put your weight in pounds, it rounds it down every time. Mm. And I think that was there since day one. Mm. Well, weight is a sensitive issue on Swift. Let's not go, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> okay, well, my next one, I think, is also perhaps going to strike a chord with, uh, with lots of people listening. Um, why can't you reciprocate ride-ons much more easily? Especially if you miss the name, you then you have to go online and see who gave you the ride-on. But it would be nice to immediately give a ride-on. Speaking of that, I found a fresh bug. Every time I log in, I get a ride-on from C. Whalen, 
as soon as I log in every single time now, probably about 15 times on in a row. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've seen other, other, <laughs> other, other people have had that bug. Yeah. Uh, um, now, at, at this point, I, I, I should say that this, this it probably does sound to people a bit like a whinge fest. But, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I absolutely love riding on Zwift and it has completely revolutionized my indoor experience. Uh, so Zwift has got an awful lot right. Oh yeah, no. As a as a core platform, I think it's it's hard to beat. I mean, I overlook all the bugs. It's just you know when you actually notice them, or more of the fact when somebody else points them out again. You know, for the hundredth time, it's like oh, I had just forgotten about that, and then you remind me about it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's completely changed my writing because I end up I end my work day by jumping on the bike and doing a, a good solid hour every day, and that just it's changed completely. I think the max I could get on before was maybe 45 minutes without being bored out of my school. Mm. And do you, how a valuable a training tool do you think Zwift is for real life racing? It's actually great. Um, seeing, I really started putting in miles on last February on Zwift. And that's when it was uh, Jarvis Island was this really steep, punchy climbs, which those made for serious intervals. And I think the first... Uh, it was probably the second race of the season. I actually ended up taking second in a race that had a, a long quarter-mile sprint section just because I'd had that sustained power building and, and was actually peaking early in the in the season based off of, you know, all those whifting in the winter. <laughs> yeah. The challenge this year is going to be how to split my season into early season and, you know, mid to late season. And how realistic a race experience do you think Zwift is able to offer? I think it's very realistic. Um, the only issue I have currently is, and, and it's evolved and they're actually starting to separate it now, is there's big gaps in between um, rider abilities. Yeah. And it was always the fact that you would see people just burn themselves out trying to hang on one lap when that's not a race and it doesn't really benefit them to, to go that hard for one lap. And then basically it's junk miles after that for their next hour and a half. Not everybody races. And uh, uh, let's get back to talking about stuff which may have a broader, a broader interest. Um, right. The workout mode, I think, has been, has been successful. Um, I would like to see a couple of things on that. And a, a couple of people have talked about it too, which is audio cues. How do, how do you feel about that? I would really like audio cues because I think half the time, especially in training mode, I'm on autopilot. I'm just keeping an eye on keeping, well, because I'm in erg mode, I can actually yeah. keep my cadence where it should be and, you know, multitask and basically take my mind off the actual training if I need to just still get a good base training, but do, do other, other stuff at the same time. So yeah. the yeah. cue would be great. What else would you like to see them add to workout mode? Uh, it would be nice to pause the workout. Yeah. Cause there's plenty of people that just, they absolutely have to jump off the trainer. I think I've got about half my workouts on, I'm doing the 12 week FTP where it just, about half of them don't show as completed because something happened, either the computer crashed or, or I had to jump off. So I think, um, some sort of pause mode or restart mode to allow you to finish the, the workout would be great. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people would welcome that. Actually, the other big thing would be a calibration course. So some sort of course where you're forced to like do a lap and make sure everything's working properly. That's um, a really good idea. Yeah, that's that's a big one because there's just too many people that jump on the island when there's there's their kid isn't sorted basically, and so and the, plus once you're on a closed course, Zwift could actually do some checks and you know tweak the algorithm a little bit for feedback. I'm sure they're working on lots of these things. Um, thank you very much indeed for your time, Mick. It's been really uh, entertaining and interesting to talk to you, and uh, I'll see you on the island. Great. Thank you, Sam. I'm putting some specific points and others the community is asking about to Zwift Big Cheese Eric Min later on. But first, let's hear from Eric on how he himself feels Zwift is shaping up in general a few weeks out of its beta phase. I think the platform has faced its first real test in the past few weeks. 
how do you think you're doing? I think uh, I think we're doing really well. Um, you know, we we hit. Uh, I will tell you that we hit almost 800 simultaneous uh, users at the peak on Tuesday. So every day since we launched has been a record day for that day. So yesterday was the record Wednesday. Tuesday was the record Tuesday. Monday was the record Monday. Wow. So we've been breaking records every single day. How long can that go on? I th- I think it can go on for some time. Um, so we expect the busiest season, uh, the peak, to, to happen to take place in in January. So we expect there to be plenty of growth from here on. Um, We we just started, right? And a lot of what we're doing is is very organic. But as numbers have grown, we have seen a few more glitches. I personally have seen more glitches in my rides than I've seen in 9, 10, 11, 12 months of riding on the the beta programme. Is there a capacity issue for Zwift or is it a whole lot more complicated than that? It's not capacity... It had more to do with just a just a bug on the, on the client actually on the, the bug. The last one that we um, stumbled on was was some sort of limit having to do with the leaderboards. So that that was addressed. That had nothing to do with with the the capacity. In fact, um, the servers are humming along pretty pretty well. Mm. Uh, so we're pretty pleased with that, and we've uh, we've rolled out a cluster so we can we can scale the the um, capacity as we, uh, on demand uh, sure. we use we use uh, cloud services so firing up additional servers is 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 uh, is a trivial task for us now mm. but presumably you're bug stamping kind of the whole time at the moment some of the things that we're still uh, fine-tuning is 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 around drafting yeah um, and it's a tricky one because because we um, because what you don't have on Zwift are breaks people ride in a pack and tether their brakes to stay behind someone. Um, and we have, to, we have to simulate all that. So we're actively testing one that, that has more refinements to, to the drafting. And I think, um, I hope that will go out today or t- tomorrow. And um, I think people will be pretty pleased with the latest tweaks that, uh, that we're making. But we're constantly fine-tuning um, uh, changes to the behavior, which is a fluid dynamics, is pretty pretty hard thing to to, to solve. Sure, sure. Um, no, no, no. I mean, I can see that getting the draft right must be fiendishly, fiendishly difficult. Yeah. Did you feel that that the, the tech support that you're able to provide, and again, we need to keep this in proportion. You know, you're still a relatively small company, but do you think the the help desk and tech support that you can provide is is sufficient to meet the demand in this very important time for you? I think, I think we're always playing catch up. The community. Um, what's great about what we have with Zwift is the the, the power of the community. Um, sometimes community can solve problems uh, that that some of the users have before we can even get to it. I, I think our our team is has a, it's a small team and it's based out of California. We have users in 140 different places. Um, this, this, people are using Zwift 24-7. There's no way we can respond to all the queries. So I think the more experienced um, users are going to the community first. And if it's something that the community can't solve, then they will open a ticket with, with us. Do we wish we had more capacity on our side? A- absolutely. And it will, it will um, happen but I would encourage people to tap into the community because more, more than not, they will run across an issue that has already been encountered and solved. How many people are working for Zwift, Eric, at the moment? We're under 50. We have a small team in, in London, small team in New York. We have a, the largest team out of California, where all the game and mobile development come out of. We have a team in, in Rio de Janeiro that focuses on on the, the back end, the servers, um, and we've got a small presence in, in, in Tokyo to help us cover the, the Asian uh, as a region. The company is up 24-7. It's mm. exhausting. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can, <laughs> I, I can imagine. Does the roadmap call for uh, quite substantial increases in staff, or is this always going to be a company that's run on a fairly uh, low input from human beings? I think we've got the core team to take us um, to the 
to the next level. Mm. Um, I think I think you will see more growth at, at the company. Um, there is just so, no shortage of of things that we can we can be doing, and there are opportunities that we just can't chase at the moment because we just don't have the bandwidth for that. I just want to just switch subject a little bit. And I remember you told me months ago when Zwift was in its early stages that you were an entertainment company that catered to cyclists. Are you still an entertainment company or are you going to be a training fitness company or are you going to be a bit of both? Well, I, I think I think we are a, a bit of both. Um, we needed to focus on um, what consumers are used to, which is you, you ride indoors to to get fit. You ride indoors because you ha- you focus on some sort of training plan. Um, and I think we need to – that's what – people are used to in terms of indoor indoor riding and i think on the on the back of that we can create all sorts of entertainment values so i'll, I'll give you an example uh, tuesday night was a very very busy night for us there were a hundred people logged in just to watch other people ride wow yeah they're, they're we call them lurkers <laughs> so you don't see their names on the on the riders list but we can track that and so we've been measuring how many hours uh, people have been logging in to watch other to watch gameplay, and it's it's in the tens of thousands of hours. And this is consistent with with the gaming industry. There there are many people who tune in to watch the top gamers uh, gamers uh, play. It's it's uh, it's been going on for for a number of years. Imagine. The Tuesday night races, um, Nathan Guerra does a wonderful job of, of commentating. But once we have the tools in place for a professional uh, commentator like uh, Matt Stevens or Dan Lloyd or Carlton Kirby or Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin, have these guys come in and, 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 um, and commentate live while the Tuesday night races are happening where our, partic- our community is, they're the stars of the event, right? I think this is this is fun. This is something you wouldn't get anywhere else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Zwift has an element of also being a spectator sport as well as a participation sport. Yes. So if you're not riding, there's no reason why you can't tune in to watch other people ride. And I think that's that's where the part of the entertainment comes in. More from Eric later. Now, one thing on Zwift that's not exactly entertaining is the FTP test. It's useful, but it's not a whole lot of fun. What's the best way to tackle this significant challenge? Listen to this. So welcome to the Zwiftcast to John Sharples of trainsharp.co.uk, a noted coach and the man who is uh, the power behind a lot of the um, workouts in Zwift workout mode. And today I wanted to talk to uh, John about um, FTP testing, which, um, as we know, has been incredibly popular on Zwift. So, John, let, let's kick off really with, 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 with a basic question. Why take an FTP test? Well, really, I think if you're um, considering taking out a training plan, uh, you have to draw a line in the sand. Um, and, and cycling, as we, as we all know, is not an easy sport. It is pretty tough. Um, so essentially what, what you're going to do by undertaking an FTP test is create your training zones. You need to know where your fitness lies today so that any training that you undertake can be tailored to your personal fitness. Indeed. So um, we're thinking of doing um, an FTP test. How is it best to prepare? Well, um, you're going to need some mental visual visual um, training techniques, I, I believe, because it is tough. Um, you want to see yourself doing well. You need to get it right in your head why you're going to do it. Um, you know, maybe it's so that, you know, later on, um, you know, you won't get dropped on the climb and you, you'll be the, uh, the hammer and not the nail, as, as a lot of people say. Um, the best way to prepare yourself for it really is not to do anything too exhaustive 48 hours beforehand. Um, you can't cheat the test. You can certainly make things worse for yourself by um, doing too much training, thinking you're going to make yourself stronger. I mean, it is what it is. If you're tired, you will suffer. Um, so I would say treat it like a race and, and just uh, some light, steady spins 24 hours before you, you, you undergo the test. Should you eat immediately before a gel or should you have a little carb snack an hour before? What would you advise? Well, everyone's different. Um, I think it's good to have um, your, your blood sugar levels up so you feel motivated and, and feel like you have the fuel to 
to do your best um you know rule of thumb you shouldn't really eat anything heavy three hours before doing this um you know certainly um have a gel um or a bar or um, a carbohydrate drink maybe before you warm up as i say everyone's different but i think the important thing is is not to feel lightheaded and make sure you feel like you have some fuel in the tank before you, you undergo the test sure is there a best time of day to do the test or is that an individual thing I, certainly i know i go better in the afternoons i'm a bit uh, groggy in the mornings yeah i i think that's personal uh, it's a really good question actually i think everyone's different some people are morning people they wake up and you know they think they can make a million dollars you know by 10 a.m other people are a bit better in the afternoon so i think it should suit you if you're a morning morning person and you usually train in the morning um then then, then do it in the morning um you know, if you're tired by the end of the day, then you may not feel like you've got to get up and go. But I would, um, as long as you're fresh and you're psyched up for it, um, I don't think it really matters. Excellent. Good advice. Now, pacing is something that people mm. agonise about in, a, in an FTP test. So, you know, let's ask the question that a lot of people pose. Is this full gas the whole way? It is the most amount of power that you can sustain. So sustain is the key word for 20 minutes. Um, so if you start off full gas, what's going to happen is you're just going to end up pulling funny faces. Um, the lactate's going to going to build and build. Um, you're trying to remove the hydrogen ions from the blood. The only way to do that effectively is breathe faster. You're already at full breathing rate, so you'll just be pu pulling funny faces, and the power will be drifting away. So I would say don't start full gas. I would say start very very steady and build into it. And I think. After 10 minutes, you should start to really feel the effort. Um, so the first 10 minutes, you know, you may be thinking, I haven't started hard enough. And I assure you, by, by the time you get to 10 or 12 minutes, you, you definitely feel um, that you're in sort of TT mode. And that's where, you know, you, you end up battling with, with the, the mental gremlins, if you like. You, if you feel like giving up or, you know, you, you're really struggling and you have to lower the power a little bit to, to finish it. It is what it is. Um, you know the test um, and I think with becoming familiar to doing the test you can pace it better so it depends how familiar you are with it um, so full gas I would say is definitely not the answer it would just get horribly messy. Can you vary your pace through the test so can you give yourself a minute where you just back off a little bit from that that hard sustainable effort and and and, and, and bring it back up again as as you start to to have a minor recovery? I think with the, the length of duration, you're going to naturally do that anyway. As I say, some people, um, you know, understand this is a tough sport. Um, taking the tests are very, very hard mentally. There may be a stage where you do daydream a little bit and your power does wander. Um, but I, I personally believe steady state is the way forward. Just hold a, you know, a steady power, steady level, and just see if you can gently squeeze it up in in the last, you know, closing minutes. Um, it, it, indeed, and, and that, that again leads me on to, to my next question. Should you give it absolutely everything you've got left in the last couple of minutes? Yeah, definitely, because I think that makes you feel like you had a good workout, it was true to yourself, uh, and you gave it all you had there. I think if you're um, you know, not, not in a, uh, an exhausted state once the test is over, you might be feeling disappointed, but as I say, it is what it is. So a bit like um, you know, a 10-mile time trial, a 16-kilometre time trial, um, you would be able to sort of pick it up to the line. So I would say that I think you only really have the last 90 seconds where you could squeeze it out at full gas. If you if you start trying too hard, maybe three or four minutes to go, again, it would just get messy. Um, so as long as you feel confident that you can just squeeze the power up a little bit, and, and five watts is quite quite a, a lot of power. Um, you know, 10, 10 watts of average power could be 45 seconds fast or slower for most people in a in a 16 kilometer or 10 mile time trial so although it doesn't seem very much um on, on indoor trainer when when you're producing numbers the the effect out on the road is is huge so you know 10 5 to 10 watts is, is quite a lot to, to lift the power sure uh and you alluded to this a little bit at the beginning but but any kind of motivational tricks that just help you get through what what, what is a, a tough 20 minutes yeah it is it's really tough um i guess you know this is this is you you know taking up a, a training program so you've already decided why you want to do this and you're walking down the path i think by learning to suffer um you, you you're going to toughen up your mind um and, and it will become you know an enjoyable pain later on um, 
the the FTP test is 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 long, so it's it's best to break it into chunks. Um, some people like to just listen to music all the way through and, and you know set a, set a, an alarm clock or a countdown timer to let them know when it's finished. Um, but I used to always see myself, um, you know, not getting dropped on the climb. Um, you know, for, for me, my goal was to make sure I could climb, um, and I knew I needed to hit these these power numbers, um, and then later lose the weight. Um, so as long as um, you know, I knew in my head why I was doing it. I was happy to to suffer. Sure, that that visualization trick can be a good one. I think, can't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, how often should you put yourself through this agony? How often should you retest? It's a good idea to retest at the end of each training block. You know, one to to see the improvements, and 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 two just to keep you motivated. I think really, I think a well trained rider. Um, would be lucky if they see a, a movement of 15 to 20 watts in one season. I think um, you know the, the beginner or novice rider may improve um, 30 watts, may improve 50 watts. It really depends where they're coming from. But I've seen someone improve 130 watts in a year, but they were brand new to the sport. So it's great for motivation, um, especially if you're starting to pay attention to other people's numbers and, of course, the, the watts per kilo game that people like to play. Sure, sure. And, and indeed, other people's numbers brings me on to my yeah. uh, my last question. Yeah. Um, so, should you? where do you stand on the great debate? Should you post your FTP on social media? Well, I think that depends on how you're made up mentally, whether you um, are, are ready for, you know, people throwing tomatoes, I always say. Um, your numbers are personal to you, depending on, you know, the size of, of the person you are. So if you're a lighter person, um, then of course your powers will be lower. Um, if you're heavier, your your numbers would be a lot higher. Um, but um, yeah, really, I think it depends on the watts per kilo side of things. Sure, John. There's some absolutely fantastic wisdom there, and I, I'm sure if people listen to that, they'll be really well prepared for an FTP test if they've not done one before, or even pick up a few tips if they're if they're uh, veterans of that particular agony. John Sharples from trainsharp.co.uk. Thank you very, very much indeed for your time. And I'm sure a lot of people will find that incredibly useful. Thanks for uh, contributing to the Zwiftcast. Thank you, Simon. Workout mode has been very popular since it launched a few weeks ago. Where's this part of Zwift heading next? I put some of your questions to Eric Min. I think the first thing you'll you'll see is um, is the ability for you to create your own workouts. And so that I think will be available to, to users uh, fairly fairly soon. And I think the other thing I'd like to mention is that once you've created these custom workouts, you, you'll be able to easily share it with others. Mm. So we can quickly build up a library of thousands of workouts. The reality is that you know when you when it comes to structured training, you only need a handful of workouts that you're you're you know used to doing. Um, but if people want to share, uh, that's something that will make very easy to do going forward. So that's the first thing. But in terms of where workout mode can go, I mean, it just, you know, use your imagination. I mean, it, we can do so much with it. Um, the obvious one would be, you know, to be able to train with a, have a virtual training partner. Mm. You know, mm. how fun would it be to be able to go out and ride with your virtual training partner, draft him? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and program him, uh, and, and so that's that's uh, sort of the obvious one. How what close? Be, how close is that, Eric? How close? Really, realistically, how close is that? I think I think it, you know technically that's not you know that's not terribly difficult. I think it's just a question of is that more important than doing something else. Okay, let's talk about cheating. If competitive riding is to have any meaning on Zwift, and I think many of the people who ride on the island would like that to be so, the deliberate cheats have to be rooted out. How can that be done? I talked to Christian Wiedemann, who's organised and takes part in the very popular Tuesday and Thursday races. Every now and then we have somebody who joins the race who rides beyond human levels um, and at that point, there's a tricky situation of, you know, wanting to encourage people to join, but also not wanting 
um, unreasonable performances to be part of the race. My experience of it is that these things are becoming much more effectively self-policed by the community and um, it, it, people it's pointed out to people on group text that perhaps they need to calibrate their trainer a little more accurately. Do, uh, I mean, do, do you think it will always be a self police situation or do you think there is a way to defeat that technologically? I, I think technologically there is no way to guarantee that somebody is not um, has not tweaked their setup uh, if they want to do it intentionally. So uh, I, I think racing on Zwift, at least the way that that we run the races right now, will always be fairly low key. Um, you know, the way I see these races, it's not so much a formalized, you know, race series. It's more like a few people getting together um, to have a training race uh, like we do at industrial parks out here. Much more from Christian in the next episode of the Zwiftcast. But I wondered, can Zwift do more to counter cheats? I asked Eric Min. I, the answer to the simple answer is no. But can we... Can we um, reduce it? I think the answer is yes. Um, and we'll, we'll be rolling out very, very soon um, ways of, of, of doing that. We've been testing it internally. Uh, actually, we've been testing it behind the scenes. And so we think the data is pretty good. Um, the cheating is, I would categorize into, into two. I mean, there probably are people who are cheating. Guess what? It's no surprise. It, it happens in... In, in, in all places. Yeah, uh, but and there, are, there are people miscalibrating. Right, well. they're, exactly. They're, and I'd say the vast majority of, of the users just have chosen the wrong uh, um, trainers or uh, are just not calibrated properly. And we try to, to reach out to those users directly just to, to support them. Um, but uh, we definitely have a way of detecting when someone is going um, unnaturally fast and then there are ways for us to to um, to make sure that they don't affect leaderboards or 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 even I think going forward rides and, and events. So absolutely, we do. But, um, although we don't flag those users today, I can tell you on a daily basis we're we're catching them. We're, Interesting. Zwift, yeah. <laughs> Zwift is watching you. Very, yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Interesting. We'll see what happens. That's almost it for the first episode of the Zwiftcast, but there's one meaty chunk left. We know there's lots of new stuff coming on Zwift. What we don't know is when it's coming. So as politely as possible, I tried to pin down Eric on some specifics. I think he tried his best to be as helpful as possible. You can judge for yourself. Will there be an option to choose which course you can ride on in the near future? Yes, yes. In the near future, I would say that's driven largely by um, the, 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 the size of the community. Whenever we feel that the, the, the course is getting too busy is, is probably when we should start offering simultaneous courses. Okay. Could you say when that might be? I, I, think, it, I think it will happen in the next, uh, possibly in the next two months. Okay. I would say. Okay. Uh, it, again, it, it really depends on how quickly the community grows. Sure. Well, that's 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 quite precise. Any plans for a velodrome? Um, we've talked about it, um, and we're talking to velodrome um, uh, track event promoters uh, because there, there's a. I think there are lots of interesting things we can do with with track promoters. Don't, my my question is whether or not uh, consumers might find it dull to be fixed on a 250 meter track mm. virtually and my second question is like how many people can you actually accommodate um, you probably wouldn't want more than 50 riders on a track at any given time so then now we're talking about having multiple rooms right where you can you can do your track or have a, a, a very limited number of users on there it could be a private track so it it, it poses all sorts of other uh, you know, questions for for us internally in terms of how we would um, make that available to to users. But I'd say long term, yes. Short term, I it's not the highest priority. Fine. Okay, that's a nice and clear answer. Yeah. Uh, 
Is there a risk with adding new courses that we dilute the social aspects because riders are thinned out across two or three at any one time? We, we think so. Um, I, I, think, I think most cyclists are social. Most cyclists go to, you know, go to places where it's safe and popular. Um, I, I, I continue to believe that people show up on Zwift because they find other people there in real time. Um, and, and as long as we have data to support that, we'll try to kind of corral and, and you know, make sure that there's enough uh, population on, on a course. Um, I, I've already heard comments about uh, Richmond, you know, on, on when it's quiet, it's, it's you know, even with 100 riders, it, it feels quiet mm. because there's so much space there. Uh, so I think the, the community is telling us that they, they want to be in a space where there are other people. Uh, and when it gets too crowded, that's when we need to really open it up for, for other courses or other tracks. Sure. How do you decide which features to roll out in which order? So we do listen to the community. Um, um, we have we we try we test different things, um, and if the test is successful, we'll keep it. If it's not successful, we'll, we'll we might even retire it. Um, but it's really about engagement. You know, every time I go on Swift, I ask myself, is this still fun? If it's not fun. We need to, to ask ourselves, you know, why. Uh, but in terms of, of the things that we have uh, in, in our roadmap, it's, it's a very, very long list um, from small features to, to very big features. And it ranges not just the game. There's also the mobile app. Um, and that's going to be a very, very important social, uh, social tool for us. Sure. What are the next three, three things on the roadmap, Eric? Uh, so there's no surprise, there's no secret about the new track that we're we're building on Matopia. So that will that's under construction, um, and we'll hope we will unveil that in in December. Um, the we're making further changes to to the the mobile app um, to to make it easier for people to find each other and and follow each other. Um, make it easier for you to to give write-ons, uh, which is for from what we can tell and the data that we're collecting is is, is very very popular and it's mo- motivating for. Um, so pe- the riders who are on the cusp of doing their metric ride or the imperial century ride, um, they get rained on with write-ons and it's it's encouraging because I know what it's like to do a metric. Uh, and, and Imperial Century, those are hard, hard rides. <laughs> yeah. Several hours, um, and to have that kind of encouragement from the community, of course, it's going to keep you motivated to, to you know, get get to that. So, um, social is is very important. The third, um, we're of course listening to the community about the things that would make events much easier to organize to yeah. to, to execute um, and it's on the list it's a very important thing and I would say that that's two part the first is that we have to build a way to corral the group um, so that people can have yeah you know, it's it's easier to to start together and there's some sort of timer and then we go off together um, that is is high on the priority after the um, after the new uh, new extension to, to Watopia. So that will enable, you know, all of the races or the club rides or to, to happen in, in a much more controlled way. Um, and I think what will follow after that are, will be results. And sure. once we have that, I think we'll take some of, the, some of the workload off the community that's been working extremely hard to both organize um, manage and and report on on the results um and it, i think once we have that we will make a, a much bigger push to to create organized rides I, I think that it may not happen this year but next year i could see a race happen some sort of event every hour on the hour yeah. happening on Zwift. yeah now those two pieces uh, are a particular interest to me and anybody who races and, and indeed people who take part in group rides and 
I'm going to push you on this because people would want me to. Do you think that could happen as soon as perhaps January? I would say in January, you will see the ability to corral the group to start an event without the timer. Mm. I think that would be the first step. Um, and that's probably the most important because uh, how many people really care about results? It's it's probably the, the, the big popular races, right? The Tuesday and Thursday night were races. Um, uh, whereas um, I, I think it's just really easier for a small group of even a dozen riders to, to start together. Uh, and, and so we'll focus on that. So, But in terms of having full support for racing, I would say it's probably february that's okay. being that's being realistic okay well it's 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 brave of you to put uh, dates on these things because i'm sure uh, people realize how difficult it can be to keep to a schedule to uh, to do these quite complicated pieces what do you um, think the maximum number of riders uh, we will see on the platform at any one time will be this winter what would be your guess so I so we've seen already about almost eight hundred. I if I were to guess, I would say by January you, you might see close to two thousand wow. at at peak. And so for us, we have to plan. You know, will it get too crowded on Watopia with two thousand riders? Probably. Mm-hmm. So we need. That's why we're working on new tracks within Watopia. I think two thousand people could comfortably fit even on the Richmond course. Richmond is a big course. It's 10 miles, the wide roads, um, so I, I'm not bothered by that. So we're looking, um, w- w- our strategy is to add more tracks and to create new feature courses like a Richmond course. And um, and we'd like to swap in different courses to just keep the community together. But as soon as we feel that, you know, one map can't support the entire community at peak hours will then start offering multiple courses at the same time uh, you've been fantastically generous with your time i think it will be absolutely fascinating for people to get this level of insight into what goes on behind the scenes at zwift eric thank you very much indeed for contributing to the Zwiftcast. thank you very much simon and that is that for episode one i hope you've enjoyed it I tried to make it the length of what I think an average ride on the island or Richmond lasts, so hopefully it'll be a good listen on the trainer. I'd love to hear suggestions for future episodes. One of the easiest ways to contact me is on my blog page, which is zwiftcast.com. You'll also find me in the Facebook groups. So if you're training, push on a little harder. Thanks for listening.